I'm going to have Molly start this off. Thanks, Gloria. I'm really excited to do this, and it's really fun because um, I have been a part of it since the beginning, and I just, I'm really connected because this is such a great community event. Whether you're a working artist or you've never done an art project like this before, it brings your story to a Fort Collins museum. And then people find so many different things to see it, too. And it has connected this community in such a unique way that I just, I love this project. So our goal today is to give you ideas, uh, tell you what might be a good thing for you, what may not be the best idea, and then I want to take some time if there's any specific questions that you have that I can answer. I was thinking, too, that we have a lot of first-time artists here, but I see a lot of returning artists, and I think that's great, too, because I think you are also a wealth of knowledge having done this the problems you may have encountered in this process, or tips that you may have learned along the way. So I'm just going to start by referencing um, this sheet, and it's basically some of the formatting things that we do throughout the years. Uh, I think your very best thing to do is come up with a good, solid idea, or a concept, or a theme. Because I know sometimes people will just jump in and start wanting to play, but with a really good idea coming through, it, it shows in the mask. And so, come up with those ideas, play a lot, and think of some ideas that you can put down. Think of what's gonna work for you, where is your comfort zone, what is your message? What would you like the viewer to come away with from experiencing your mask? Some masks are very, very personal, and it is a cathartic experience to work through whatever personal issues you may have. This might be a tribute. I've seen some beautiful tributes to people in their masks. It may be um, the beauty of nature. It may be something that you do as an art form that you want to share. So, you know, there's so many ideas out there, but I think really gelling your idea before you start will help you not feel a little overwhelmed in the process as well. Um, I think knowing that these are made out of um, fired clay, and Scott Ackerman, who does our masks, does a wonderful job, but they're very thin sometimes. So uh, you have to be a little fragile, or you have to be a little careful. They are a little fragile at times. So a lot of times when I'm working on it, I will put some bubble wrap down, things like that. When I start, I usually rinse it off. Sometimes the water might turn your mask a little yellow. There's some minerals and things in our water. So if you have a filtered water spigot or something, you might choose to do that. But depending on what you do, rinsing it off gets the clay dust off. And that will help whatever materials you want to put on stay better. And so, um, it dries very quickly, it's very porous, and sometimes that's a great thing. So if you like it sucking in different colors, maybe you're a watercolor artist and you want to keep pulling that in, that's fine. Another thing you may want to do is gesso, and you can get all types of gesso. There's, um, it's a basically like an acrylic sealant. So you can start with a black or a white or anything, but that would give you a sealed surface to work on, which if you're building up layers of paint, or things like that, you might want that seal on there. It might just give you a stronger base. It also makes for brighter colors. So if you choose to do uh, something like colored pencils, <clears throat> gel pens, markers, things that, uh, permanent markers that would be on there, you might want to start with a real um, bright white gesso. Also, depending on what you want to do, these are quite smooth. But uh, there are times that you might get some spots that you may want to touch up with a little bit of sandpaper. Give it a little, and maybe if you're doing something where you need more grit, get a higher grit sandpaper and give it a little more texture because you can kind of scratch into it a little bit. If that helps, if you're gluing things on that need to really hold on to it, you could scratch it a little bit. But even then, it's so porous, the glue will go right on. Speaking of which, if you're gluing on, you may not want to, you know, the glue will stick with the gesso, but if you're primarily doing something like an entire mosaic, I would not gesso it because you want that glue to really hold to this mask. Um, painting, I think painting is, is a really fun thing to do on these. Now, it leaves, like the minute you touch it, it's there. And that can be really intimidating because it's like, oh, I only get one and now I just did this and that wasn't what I wanted to have happen. But that's okay, I always say, think, think of that as a happy accident. If you get something that you don't like, don't just give up. Oh, didn't work. I'm, I'm kind of that. I, now I don't know what to do. You can always continue on. You can cover it up. You can wash it off. You can maybe take that as a jumping point to the next step and maybe that inspires a new idea that you might have. So just know when you're painting, if there's that stain and you don't like it, you can 
get your gesso out, and you cover it right up, and you got a blank canvas to start over with. And sometimes that's reassuring if it's a little intimidating to come in. At the same time, I think the freedom of play on the mask can be really exciting for some people. And, and that shows the mask, where I can almost tell some people that pull back and work very timidly on it. You see that in the process, where if you can just go for it and really have fun and try, you know, go back to being a first grader. I teach art at an elementary school, and if we all had the confidence of a first grader in our art, it's, it's incredible what we would do. So be confident as you do it, and know you're doing great. Just, there's no rules, you can, you'll get there. Um, personally, I like acrylic paints. And you can get fancy, fancy schmancy ones, you can get cheap ones, even the little, these little craft ones. They're great, they work wonderful. If you like to put a little uh, metallic in it, a very little metallic goes a long ways. And I've seen it used beautifully, and I think just be mindful in the choices you make to put things on your mask so that there's a reason for it and it will enhance the beauty of your mask. Um, Again, if you're not used to using acrylics and you want to play, paint a bunch, try some, play. Really just get used to it, feel good with it, and then go for it and try it and do what you need to do. In doing my mask last year, I found a trick with um, contact paper. And so then I was like, ah! Oh. So I was playing with forms and shapes on the contact paper. I could then take the shapes, and this isn't the exact one, cut that shape out and really play with it on the mask. So that helped me to kind of really work on my design. Do I like it better on this side? Would I rather have it over here? Is it something I could lay down and put across here? How does it relate to the shape of the mask when I do this? And so being a visual person, it helped me to kind of, okay, I can plan this out on here first. But this is just a rough sketch, and then you could Lay it right on here if you needed to for stenciling. Maybe you wanted to have a very specific shape, pattern, or design painted on and you're having a hard time getting that perfect line. There's no reason you couldn't use something to give you that sharp edge and then this would be <coughs> I'd let it dry, bless you, before you peel it off, but then, you know, take that off and you've got that nice line underneath too. So this is just a King Supers contact paper, uh, shelf liner. Yeah, yeah, not the not the fuzzy stuff, but <coughs> the old plastic stuff. Um, a, if you're an oil painter, by all means, go for it. And if you've never used oils, by all means, I would not encourage you to use it on this project. Oil paints are beautiful. <laughs> they're wonderful. They're very hard to work with. And I think the cleaning process, mineral spirits, it's it's a unique type of medium that. If you know how you're doing it, go for it. I've seen some beautiful masks done in oil. But I've also had some people who've never tried and said, ooh, I've wanted to try this. And I thought, this might be, to me, acrylics. Do the same thing. You can get a gel medium to really get that thicker feel. You can get a, a medium that gives it a gloss, a high gloss. So if you want to add more texture and depth to your paints, and some of these might be ruddy, then you'll look for a, I think a, a gel medium, basically, that will make it a thicker paint and you could put it on a paint knife or something. So depending on the needs that you have. Watercolors, oh, I think it's Karen Ramsey does beautiful watercolors and then she will outline hers. She's done uh, boaters in Venice and the bicycle. And, um, so that is a very soft look, the watercolors. And I think hers are probably the fancy schmancy kind, but you know, a lot of times just, just little watercolors will work. Later on, if we have a little time, if you want to try a couple of things, I've brought some, some little things. If you want to just see how a different medium reacts on the clay, I brought a couple extra pieces. If that helps you to want to play with something. With watercolor, would you <coughs> gesso first, or would you use the gloss I think, you know, I think it's going to give a very different look. And if you're not sure, test it on the back. Do a test part on the back of it where you gesso a little, let it dry for, you know, half hour or so, and then do a test of a red on one side and a red on the gesso side, the, and see how it dries, see how it, how long that takes and what that looks like. I haven't used the watercolor on a gesso surface as much. For me, it's the fact that it's sucking it in so quickly and it becomes a stain on here that I appreciate that part of it. So, 
Again, it's what works best for you, and if, when in doubt, use the back as a little tester for something. Um, after she's watercolored, she'll come in and outline, and when you use something to outline, use a permanent Sharpie. Good morning. Uh, Sharpies or anything that is a permanent base. You don't want to use a water-based or water-soluble pen. Those would smear, or uh, if you put a sealant on even then, that could kind of bleed a little bit on the sides. Um, I just brought all kinds of stuff. Again, some people are really good at using pencils, and I think the harder lead pencils will not smear as much. Um, uh, there were some in charcoal that were beautiful, but again, you want to think of how this is going to be over time. This is something that, you know, you want them to last for years and years and years and years and hang proudly at people's homes. So use materials that will last. They won't yellow if you're using papers, things like that, that might maybe not stand the test of time. I think natural, um, like I have a beautiful leaf that I found that's just gorgeous. I need to use it as inspiration and not as a piece on my mask because it wouldn't last 10 minutes on my mask. The very first year we had somebody who uh, did a chocolate mask and oh. dipped their mask in chocolate. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't even make it to the hanging of the show before the chocolate turned funky and started falling off. So those kinds of things and thinking like, great idea, we wound up recreating it using that thick gesso and brown paint and making it look exactly like chocolate. But, so there's ways to, to do that without it being like, oh, well, that was great, but it didn't work. <laughs> um, the pen and inks, we were looking at those. Collage. I brought this one as a wonderful example of a collage. I think it's Tammy Arado uh, did this one. And now this is the extreme of a collage because this is an ode to tennis. So all the words on here are pretty much about tennis. I think she had her children, her husband, cutting for hours, for a long time on this. But what I appreciate is the workmanship. Nice craftsmanship makes a beautiful mask. And sloppy craftsmanship shows. You see it when you look at something and you'll think, I love it if they had just cleaned that up or if this had been done just a little neater. So I think be proud of putting your name and your mask up with good craftsmanship. This, I would say, if you're gonna use paper, things like this, Think of how that's going to lay on the surface. You can't take a full piece and lay it flat. So some people have chosen to put images on canvas. You can now print on almost anything. And material like uh, canvas, you can eventually get to stretch in different ways. Elmer's glue works great just to hold things down. Look for glue that doesn't yellow. And so Eileen's craft glue is a good one. Oh, I think where my put you? Um, oh, she's hiding. I think, oh yes, thank you. I think for putting lots of things on fabric, many different things that uh, will attach easily and are not heavy. The craft glue works great. The Elmer's glue works great just for putting things on. And then a lot of these surfaces, you can put a Mod Podge cover on. And Mod Podge is that old school stuff. This is what makes me think of elementary school when I went to school, is the smell of Mod Podge. It smells very unique smell, but it gives a very high shine if you get the high gloss. There's a matte if you want a matte surface. And Krylon also makes like a spray paint that you could put on at the end. And I think it just finishes it nicely with something that you might have on here. Gives it a good surface. Photographs, very thick, so you may want to look at getting things printed in a different format depending on what you want to put down. And um, again, how that's going to lay on the mask and how you can get that on there. Different materials you can get to stretch and really get laying down. I've done that with fabric where you could soak your fabric in just even a glue and then get it to really sit on here. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if there are specific questions about any of these, please let me know. Collaging, let's see. Yes, look for things that are, uh, same with your papers and materials as you're looking for those, that they would be acid-free. Things that might, you know, I look at the pictures from when I was a kid and everything's yellowed and all the pages are all curling up and, and it, I didn't think it was that long ago, but <laughs> <laughs> long enough that it made a difference. So, you know, find good materials that you can use that will stay on the test of time as well. 
Drilling and cutting is tricky, but it can very much be done. Um, I think it was the Arvidsons, maybe? They would do theirs in long strips. Well, they got help. So if there are certain things that you're not sure how to do, or you're not good with tools, or you don't feel comfortable doing these things, there are great people in our community who can help. And I think some people have gone to tile cutters and had shapes cut in a specific way because they have the great tools to do that with. And they're not going to, and, and they'll tell you if they can't. So if you have an idea, you can kind of go with that. This is one my husband made early on, and he just kind of worked his way around through this. He drilled a hole, and then uh, this he called spin, and it was about politics, and the spin on politics and how money is behind a lot of that. So he uh, just made his own dollar bill to put behind here, and this was the shape that he had wanted. So he started by drilling, which is a drill, in which case he put, he wet the surface first, and put masking tape on both sides. By drilling through with a good uh, drill bit, a ceramic drill bit, that way it keeps it from uh, really breaking off in little pieces here. So you may have a need for many holes or something like that, and that tape and wetting it down I think helps to keep it a clear, a clear drill. I would also drill from the front to the back, so if anything is breaking off, it's breaking off in the back. And then putting your surface on something, an old pillow, uh, bubble wrap, things like that, so that when you're working on it, it's not against a table that it can really jar on. And keep it wet, like, like a glass. If you keep it wet, like with a wet grinder, and that, it I, really helps. Oh good, oh good, yeah, that would make sense, because in tile cutting, they're constantly putting yeah, water on exactly. it to have that clean cut. Yeah. So, um, let's see, drilling, cutting, other building up masks can be quite fun too, and um, I've seen it done in a lot of different ways. I think, again, it comes down to craftsmanship, that if you choose to add things to the mask, it should enhance the mask or become a part of the mask in a way that really is a nice thing. This is uh, a kind of oven-baked Sculpey. So Sculpey is just a, a clay you can get at a craft shop and bake in your oven. And so you could ideally make whatever shape or build up your shape. Uh, you could leave it on the mask. This mask has been fired to over 1400 degrees and most of the Sculpey clays you're cooking at about 200 degrees in your oven. So if you had a specific form that you wanted to put and have it keep that form, you could put this whole thing right in your oven, cook that, again keeping those edges really nice, you could really get them smooth so that then after it's cooked it will remain in that shape. Then you're going to use your good glue, your craft glue, and glue that on, sand your surface, paint it, and it may give it a different form. So I don't know if that makes sense the way I'm explaining that. Go ahead. Did you need to put the mask in the sculpting oven? Or just and you can now because we don't have backs on them. When we have backs on them, I wouldn't recommend it because of the glue and the metal pieces. But this is something that could get put in a kiln. So if you are somebody who would like to refire this, that there are places in town that will let you take them in and um, and uh, like this is a glazed mask here. Now this one's a little different because it's a rack who fired. This was a potter who made this. Judy Terry made this one. And so if you're comfortable doing clay and have access to kilns, glazes, that's another option and another nice reason for not having the backs on. Um, paint your own pottery places in town have been great about letting people come in and work on designs for that as well, if that's something that enhances what you want to do. So the question, you push it in the oven, just at your home, that's not going to damage the mask? That should not way. damage the mask. Now, because of how high it's already been fired? Correct. Is that? correct. So I would be mindful in, uh, you know, putting it and taking it out just that you're careful and maybe even setting it on a cookie sheet so that this edge isn't right on your uh, on there. It should, like, I could put this in an oven and take it right up. It should be fine. So, um, with that, you don't have to put this in if you have the shape. Say you have made something completely different that doesn't require the mask shape on it, and you just know you wanted this little face shape that you've made, then I wouldn't put the mask in. If it doesn't need to be in, sometimes you can get the shape of it, and it'll stay just like this. So I'll just put this in my little in toaster oven and cook it like that. So, um, but, it's but if you needed to, if you're wanting a shape that's from the mask, then I think 
uh, because it may distort by taking it off and putting it in your oven and not keep that shape, I say go for it. I say put it right in and work on it that way. And I was thinking about um, an idea where I needed to attach some or some little pinwheels. I was thinking of my kids at, at Bennett are planting pinwheels on Monday for the International Day of Peace, and I was inspired and thought, oh, how can I do that? And so I thought if I did a layer of clay where I then wanted to have something coming out of it, that might be my best bet. So I don't know if that's where I'll go with it, but we'll see. <laughs> When it comes back out with those fine edges that you trim, does, does it just slip right off until you secure it? So, yeah, you will. Like, uh, Bob Coons has done quite a few masks. Oh, I think he's Bob. He's done almost every year, I think, for us. And, like, this would be an example where he's put the clay on here. So that clay could get fired. Uh, and if it's easier to paint it before you attach it, as long as then at that point you somehow very firmly attach it back onto here. And it shouldn't, I mean, it would slide without it. Now, another great uh, glue that you'll want to use, and this is the glue that you'll probably want to use uh, for, oh good, the Goop or the E6000. Both of these are wonderful um, silicone glues. I think and this is what you're going to want to use for the big stuff. So I've done some masks that were split masks and a big heavy mask piece on it. Or maybe for like James Linksweiler did this mask and attached it to uh, the masonite board on the back. And so this was a great way to then extend this hair and this feature here, and then it also really nicely is on here. He then can hang from the back of this. The last thing you want to have happen is have stuff fall off, and that has happened. Or add your mask. I think about that with the hanging on the back because the very first year we did this, Gary Hickson's mask fell off the wall and broke. Oh. And he said, I took that as a sign to never make another mask. And I'm like, no, that's not why. It's because I didn't do the hanging properly. It wasn't your fault. That was my hanger. So we learned from that. And, you know, really securing the items makes all the difference. And it would be heartbreaking to have put time, effort, love, and money into your mask and then, bonk, have it fall. So, um, for those two blues, do they take a long time? Good point. These are very stinky, um, and I would give them 24 hours. So usually what I'll do is, uh, depending on what it is, if it's something that needs to go on before the next step, I will secure it and then possibly tape it with a masking tape, depending on what it is, so that that will hold it in place. The glues are very specific, and they'll tell you usually put glue on one side, let that sit for a minute, then put your glue on the second piece and then put those together. There's usually a timing component that's on the instructions that will help with that. Um, I then will put it in a place where it can just sit for a day. And then usually that's that's all made to come back the next day and it works great. So when people put masks on a piece of canvas, they need to make wood? Yes. And it stays on that? Um, yes. And this glue, it will stay. This glue will go, this mask will stay to the thing longer than anything else. And it's not so heavy that it pulls the canvas on that frame. You, that's why you want to make sure you have a good good frame. Like if you're going to do something like that, I think the thicker edge frames are stronger and I wouldn't go with your dollar canvas frame on that one because mm -hmm. you do want it to last and I think, um, uh, let's see, she does one every year as a flower. It's absolutely beautiful. Susan Abel. Yes, Susan Abel. Abel. And Abel, thank you. Abel. Ably. We'll get there. <laughs> and so that's exactly what she does. She says every year she's inspired by the shape of the mask to create it into a flower. And so she attaches it to a canvas and then creates her flower image from there. Um, this one here, um, Sylvia Gotzi made this the first year and she's a beautiful calligraphy artist. So that's where she was able to share her talents. This is acrylic paint and then um, after putting it on, drilled some holes and put it through, put it through um, into a, a shadow box. And again, just that, putting it in a shadow box made this such a finished piece. And it really brings a viewer into it more than for this piece specifically. I think it just depends on the piece and make sure it's something that enhances the work when you do it. Somebody have a question? I haven't stopped for questions. I'm just talking, talking. <laughs> 
Um, and actually, I think if, if there's any questions, I did put my phone number on there. You're more than welcome to call me along the way. I have artists, hey, I'm trying this, and this is happening. What can I do? Or do you recommend this or this? And just give me a call. I'm happy to, to there might be specifics that, that you're not sure, or just a little, a little encouragement, you bet, go for it. We do ask that the original shape is somewhere in the final design, meaning you're referencing it or it's in there. We've, uh, we say that so that we don't just go buy a mask at a store. Here's my mask. Mm -hmm. But it is a, a piece of art built off of this form. Mm -hmm. So yes. how about when they, um, some of them cut the mask in half? Mm -hmm. Is that like regular saw? So, um, and we were saying tile, tile saws, tile cutters are great. Um, and if you have access to those or even go in town to some of the, and stone cutters. I think uh, some of the stone masons in town have helped people carve masks for certain shapes too. But, um, so, so many ideas, yes? Okay, so you have a disaster and it breaks. And again, we encourage the happy accident, and I've done this. Um, because there is a, a limited number of masks, we only have one per person. So then you go, ah, crumb, and maybe it's a different word. But but that's the word I mean. Yeah, that's the one. Absolutely. And you think that I would recommend stepping away from it for a few days. <laughs> and, and, and coming at it with fresh eyes and thinking, like life, this is how things happen. We can't always control how this happens, but this is where I am today. I have pieces in front of me. How can I take these pieces and now make a piece of art? And that may just take you in a whole new direction. You may only use a part of it, and it may take you somewhere. You may get so frustrated you throw it on the ground and break it into even more pieces and grind it up into something else, and then it turns into something new. But hopefully that will give you the op opportunity to just say, well, there was that idea, now I'm gonna try something else. And that has happened. We've had people that were, the cat knocked it on the floor, mm -hmm. and it broke. And you can try putting it back together, but you can, for the most part, see those seams. And so I've seen some actually really nice ones that have come out of a broken mask in a way that they were able to transform it into something new, probably very different than their original idea. So you still, though, you said it still needs to... Or reference. In that, what do you so when I say reference, um, we've had people who have done drawings and included the shape of the mask in it. Huh? Glass artists are often using this just as a base, and they will fire a glass piece using this as their form, and this is not turned into the museum at the end. But their piece incorporated the shape of the mask. Um, photographs, Mickey Bookstaber has taken photographs of her mask in different places, and then the photographs became the work that were turned in. So there's a lot of new, think it way outside the box, and that would be okay too. But mostly that referencing the form and shape is that we're bringing it back to this mask and not purchasing a different mask to substitute for What's where that came from. So the, the glass that is used when it's kind of slumped, slumped mm -hmm. over it, is that a special kind of glass that is purchased? It somewhere? is, and, and that made me think of James King uh, many years ago. Anne Campbell and James King did beautiful masks, and it used to be called Faces in the Crowd. And one year he made all these little glass faces and it took firing and firing in a glass, they were glass artists with their, their glass kiln. And on the very last firing, on the bottom one, he used the wrong kind of glass. And it split and it cracked and he tied it all up with wire. He didn't stop, but he kept making it. And then he felt like, no, no, I don't. So he made even another one. So even glass artists were having a hard time with that. The other, the glass art, Kathy Doherty does some beautiful ones. and. Um, Marge Brodel's been doing some too, but I think it takes knowing that medium because they'll fire it and refire it in ways to get it to lay down. When you talk about a flat surface coming down to a, a formed shape, it's going to take a little. So getting this used is to. not really something that you could take and say, "Could you fire this for me, please?" I would not. I'd be surprised. But Kathy Doherty's an artist who loves to have you into her studio and maybe would help you show you how you might be able to do something like that. I put her up to that, and then I have no idea if she's even in a position to do that. But there may be glass artists in town who would work with you to do something if that's something you're excited about. Um, mosaics would be another way to incorporate glass, and again, um, if that's a you know, practice on something first to see how that's going to look, and then if that's something you feel good about, I think there's a lot of meaning there. Um, as we talk about attaching things and getting them on, 
I'm going to hand this over to Cheryl because the attaching part is so very important. You have all these wonderful ideas, all these wonderful times on here, and the last thing you want to have it do is pop off of there. Before you hand it in, do think about um, boxing it up for us, because if yours gets to be bigger than the box it came from, they are going to be transported, they're going to be stored, they're going to be removed to be photographed, they're going to be put back in the boxes, they're going to be transported again, they're going to be hung, they're going to be transported. So there's a lot of moving. I would highly recommend packing them well. And if it doesn't fit in the box, find a good box. You could Somebody got a, a wreath box that was perfect for the size of their mask, and it made the life of the people at the museum so much easier when it comes to them well packaged so that it stays safe, it can be transported, things will get stacked on top of them, and if you just bring it in open, that's not really safe for the mask. So think about boxing it as well, but when you get ready to put your, uh, your stuff on the back, I think Cheryl is going to tell us all about that. Okay, it, um, yeah, this is important. We had some issues this last year with, um, with just not enough blue or the wrong kind of blue, and they were coming loose, and you, know, you just don't want your mask to, after all that work, to fall on the ground. So um, what we found is, well, I used to use E6002. Um, <laughs> we found that this glue works really well. And I, I was testing other glues, and um, this one says goo household glue. Um, it does say ceramics and metal. You're, you're putting ceramic and metal together. So this is the one that has been working well for us. Um, apparently that also works well. You I think I actually that. prefer the goop. Do you? I think the goop is okay. better. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is once you figure out the orientation of your mask, um, if it's all done and you're, you're able to lay it, you know, if when you're done it, you can lay it down flat like this um, to put your hard ground great. If you're going to be putting something really fragile on the front of this, and you know that it's going to be hanging this way or this way, um, you can put your hard ground ahead of time. But um, you know, once you just need to know which way you're going to hang your mask. Some people hang them this way, you can hang it angled. Um, but the key is, I think, is getting enough of this goop on there and um, attaching it. So if you, um, you kind of want to, when you're putting this on, you want to get these. Uh, flat, piece, flat pieces um, to lay nicely. So, maybe Cheryl. Yeah. If you guys would like to move around the table and see what she's doing so you can actually see. Go right ahead. Because it's, it's hard to know what she's talking about. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, so you're going to get these and they might be all twisted or, you know. So, I. When I was putting them on, I like to get this exactly in the shape I want. I don't want these one twisted out and one flat, you know, because because then when I put them in the, the glue in, it's really gonna want to pull out of the glue. So um, I like to get these exactly where I want them. So if I'm gonna, if you're gonna hang it this way, you know, kind of have to see is this gonna be hiding when I put a piece of hardware. I mean, maybe I'll have a, you know, a hook. Um, you want it down far enough that your hardware, I mean, the thing on the wall is not going to show. So if this wire were right at the very top, you know, if, the, if you attached it like this, then, you know, your nail's going to show up from the back. So get it down inside a little bit. Um, it, this little shape works perfectly um, to keep it right about where the eyes are. Kind of, um, does that make sense? I'm going to write in there. It's a nice flat section. Um, the wire will be hidden when we hang it. So I just kind of I just kind of work this until it kind of wants to lay nicely for me. Um, and where do you find these hangers at? These are in your box. Oh, wonderful. You should have one of these if you don't call me <laughs> or call someone at the museum. They should every box should have one of these. Um, you'll just need to go get your own goop. And then how long do you hold it in place? Well, we usually, so what we do is, it needs to sit, this stuff needs to sit for 24 hours. Okay. I would even, if you don't have to move it right away, leave it for a couple days. Just let it sit um, and cure for you. 
So what you want to do is get a really, once you, I'll even mark it sometimes, it depends on where I'm going to put them, but um, you want a big piece, like, uh, like a quarter to a half dollar size. Oh, wow. And just to make sure it's going to stay. And then you stick your, um, well, I guess I should do one at a time. I'll even take um, like a piece of paper or a, um, a stick or something and kind of push a little extra of the glue on the top. This glue will, you know, is going to go into the ceramic and soak in there and then get a piece of um, masking tape, but I forgot my masking tape, so we're using a band-aid. <laughs> <laughs> and you just want to kind of hold it down there. So I'll get both of these on. And I'm not doing a very good job on this one. Okay. Get them both. If you use a small one, scary. <laughs> work it around. Pretend that I had um, masking tape. It works a little better than man needs. <laughs> so um, this big old glob of glue is going to disappear? No, it no, is going to stay there. Okay. So, but if, just make sure it's kind of buried in the glue. That's what I do. Um, so be generous with the glue. Be generous with the glue. Push it, get it pushed down in. And the, the tape should hold it kind of flat down onto the um, onto the mask. And then this piece sometimes flips around, and um, sometimes I'll just put a little support on there. That'll tip it. That'll just hold these also down. So um, occasionally, when I have when I did it without this, eventually the the wire kind of like started falling down, mm -hmm. and then these were tipping up. So you know whatever you can do to kind of hold it into place, very simply, and then you just let it sit there. You don't need to put any sort of lightweight weight on there to push it down or anything like that? No, you should have, the tape, um, the masking tape really does, when you stretch it across, um, you've got a little time to work with this here, but you know, you can get it um, secured just with the masking tape. And then when you're done, you just pull the masking tape off, and if there's a little masking tape um, left in the glue, you know, no one's looking at the back here, right? So, um, just be generous, quarter to, you know, you probably could do it, you could get away with a little less, but uh, we've had, if your mask is really heavy, we have a few that, you know, just really needs, really just need a really strong thing. If you have a, a mask, that, is that like this here, and then you paint it over? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So that was the very first year we tried, I was getting really, that was, not, so I tried this. We tried using uh, things that were already in the clay, uh -huh. um, but like I said, after Gary Hickson's fell and broke, we decided that is not <laughs> a good way to do it. And so these are mirror hangers. Oh, look, the tape's on. These are just mirror hangers from the uh, Ace Hardware or wherever we got those. And and that's, See, that's not as much glue, but we had. I've had some that had this much glue, and if it's a heavy mask, they were they were coming off. It, so it's better to go with more. Uh, yeah, just let it dry and put more on top because I can't yeah. See. yeah, if you if you did a smaller amount and you can always go back and add a big blob later. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I just I say just go save because you never know how heavy your mask is if you don't know what you're doing. Um, if you decide you want to add something later, at least your <laughs> at least your thing's gonna be secure for whatever you do with it. Now we did have um, do you have any other advice on hanging because you've been doing this more. Um, if your mask is really heavy, this is not maybe the approach you want to go. So you're going to have to find, we had some really large, you know, like really heavy mosaic pieces. You might need to um, find someone that can help you if you don't know how to um, get a set of, maybe a, a base. What, what have people done? Like, okay, so like James Lee Swiler put his on and then drilled through and then is using like double wire on that. So, um, just like any kind of, like I would think about the framing piece, whether it's uh, even take it to a framer if you're not sure and see if they can come up with some good ideas. Something that you know will stand the weight of the material that's holding it on the walls over that time. Um, and
and if it's something that's going to sit on the table, that would be different. But again, you're looking at how that would stay in whatever way, <clears throat> whatever way you want it to be. Yeah, if you have any other things. If you're concerned, it probably needs to be strengthened. 